Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another wild interview with Fabrizio Lazardo. Today, we have another great guest with us. It is Dr. Nyaga Leonard. Nyaga is working in Vietnam with a species I'm sure many of you haven't heard of. It is the Catbalango, Trachypithecus. Sorry, could you say? Trachypithecus polycephalus. Great, that's the species. Niaga, it is a pleasure to have you here finally. Really, it's great to talk and raise awareness about this endangered species. And not only that, but raise awareness about one of Vietnam's most imperial wildlife species. Welcome to the channel, and I hope we can raise awareness together. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for having me on, Fabrizio. This is a pleasure to be here. I'm always happy to talk with people about the Balangar and about the larger context in which it fits. And it's fantastic. I mean, all over the world, we have species in a similar situation. So bringing awareness to them from wherever you are helps to not only conserve the species in its local area, but makes people more aware of what's in their own areas too. So thank you for organizing. This is, this is fantastic. Thanks to you for, accept, for accepting this opportunity. And I think we can start now. Mm -hmm. First of all, I would like to ask you a little more about you, about mm -hmm. your starts in conservation. How did you start working <laughs> in conservation in general, not yeah. exactly with the species? Mm -hmm. um, that's always kind of a funny question because there's a bunch of different pathways people take to that. I grew up in the Northwest of California on the coast. And that was an area and back in the early 70s that had a lot of the people who were starting off a lot of the sustainability movements and kind of environmental protection movements and things like that. So without really realizing it, I grew up around a lot of those people. And my mother was instrumental in getting a, it was called the Shark and Ray Derby, which is a small bay called Tamales Bay. They used to hunt, like a sportsman's event, used to hunt the sharks and rays there and give out kegs of beer as the prizes and things. So she and the local folks got that stopped. So I was always around that sort of a thing when I was little. Um, I read a lot growing up and one of the first books I read was actually Dune by Frank Herbert. And there's one character in it, uh, Dr. Leek Kynes, who is the imperial planetologist. And I, growing up, I also found like a fantastic job to have. Your job was to go to different planets and learn about the planet and study the planet and help to gain new knowledge about it, protect it, and learn all the intricacies of it. So even from a small age, that was always a really interesting idea to me. Going into conservation work actually as a profession took quite a while because I was never quite sure what I wanted to do. So I went through my regular schooling. Um, during high school, I spent a summer working with the Sea Shepherds when they were in dock and helped refit the ship and things like that. This was back in the early 90s. Uh, in undergrad, I spent a summer working on ice fields up in Alaska, studying glaciers and ice movement and climate change and that sort of a thing. After undergrad, I studied anthropology and geology. After that, I ended up moving to China for a while and teaching university in China. Went to Taiwan after that for a little while, which was a short, relatively short time there. Came back to the US, had some trouble finding what I was doing for a little while. You come up from abroad and you don't really have any resources to start off again. I wound up getting a job in a winery and I was making wine for a while as a cellar master, but it was a small estate vineyard. And the owner was really interested in shifting things over to be more sustainable and more ecologically friendly. So I got to be involved in a lot of other things, not just making the wine. So we helped to, con I helped to convert a lot of the tractors over to run a vegetable oil instead, set up a fuel conversion system to take used vegetable oil from the restaurants and things around, use those for the, uh, the vehicles we we're using. I helped to do some of the creek restoration in the area. We started ripping out vineyard rows and putting native plants in to use uh, a mixture of native insects and native predators to help control the pest insects and things like that. So I was involved in that sort of a thing within the agricultural field there. And after about five years, my girlfriend and I decided we wanted to do something different. So I quit that job and went to South America. And I didn't want to go travel, I wanted to go do something. So we found a fantastic organization in Northern Ecuador in the cloud forest. Um, this is it's now currently called uh, Osos Andinos. So it's working with the Andean spectacled bear. Spent a few months there tracking the bears, all their radio gear and all that, hiking around, and also being involved with the community. Because as you've mentioned, as other guests have mentioned on your show, you really have to have community support. Without community support, conservation is not going to work. So with that, we're 
looking for the bears, tracking their habitat, trying to catch them, put collars on them, get a difference in the movements between males and females, what kind of use they had for the area, and working with the communities to help deal with issues where bears are coming to eat crops, uh, deal with hunting issues, that sort of a thing. From there, went down to Peru and worked in a, a small conservation organization that's starting up called Crees, which was a um, conservation and education in the jungle in, in La Silva. And um, that was a combination of using foreign graduate students mainly coming in to study the area and using the funds they provided to also provide opportunities for Peruvian citizens, Peruvian students to come and work there as well, because they couldn't, oftentimes couldn't afford that sort of a thing. It was pretty new. So we're helping to set up the actual grounds and structure for that. So we're setting up a, a gentry monitoring array, which is a one kilometer grid to the forest, where you could monitor a whole bunch of different kinds of activities within the, the jungle in the same way they've been monitored elsewhere across other parts of South America. And this is a really important thing because oftentimes the techniques used to study in one area don't transfer over very well to compare to another area because they're using established trails or using slightly different techniques or using different equipment, that sort of a thing. So setting up a standardized study system that is applied with the same standards in multiple areas allows you to compare the information much more easily from different areas and see what sort of changes and things are happening. So I was the, I won the resident naturalist for that for a little while. Then down to Bolivia and worked in Bolivia briefly with a, at a small reserve helping to fix a few things, the water supplies and stuff like that. Uh, came back to the States, worked in the States for a while doing odd jobs. And eventually in my 30s, I guess, went back to grad school. <laughs> went to the East Coast in the US, um, got into a graduate program, which is a, a very small, a very, very small, eight people total. Uh, program that was working specifically on field naturalist style work and ecological planning style work. So it was not a thesis based system, it was a hands on practical system. So we did some conservation work there locally with uh, when the land trust was trying to purchase land and there's some conflicts with the local people about how things were organized. So we helped to step in a little bit, manage that and got this area protected. And then for my project, I went to work with Shenandoah National Park on the east coast of the US to develop a plant monitor and protocol to track endangered plants that were on the very southern edge of the range, which could be used as um, my, used as a way to track potential changes in climate and that was going to affect the local vegetation. Uh, after that, worked in Vermont for a while on wild connectivity issues. Once that, that was a contract position, once that was done, was looking around for other work, found a job in Indonesia, worked in orangutans for a bit, that fell through, came back to the States, and then found this job and have been here since 2014. So a lot of bouncing around. <laughs> oh my God, Niaga, I think you told me your entire life in, <laughs> in five minutes, I don't know, really. You know, that's so much information. I have a lot of questions, of course. Of course. What I think, um, first of all, you mentioned that since since a young age, your mother inspired you at first on conservation mm -hmm. and on protecting the the different species, like the sharks you mm -hmm. mentioned. Mm -hmm. So what do you feel would have happened if you hadn't read the book? The book, what was the name, sorry, Dunes or? Frank Herbert to Dune. It's actually a relatively minor character, but it's a character that sounded like an interesting position you had. <laughs> wow. Well, yes, of course, you know, primatology or conservation, conservatory, mm, be a, being a conservationist, mm -hmm. for me, would be a really fun job, or, or mm -hmm. not fun, but important at the same time, like, you are helping a species, but you are also enjoying what you are doing, and, because you know it will be for change, it will be for a better world. Mm -hmm. What does, it, what does it feel helping a species like the Catbalango that by many it's so lesser known that even for me, I didn't hear about it since I would say last year, mm -hmm. maybe. So how does it feel working with such a lesser known species? That's actually a really interesting question. Um, so one of, the, one of the truths about conservation that people don't realize is that much of the actual conservation portion of the work deals with politics 
and economics and livelihoods and social issues. The stuff where you go in the field and look at the animals and collect information on plants and behaviors and things like that, that's really important. But that's basically data collection. And you're using that data to then get information. And you use that information to make an argument to get politicians and policymakers to change policies or to get local businesses to change their behaviors or that sort of a thing. So that can be really frustrating sometimes because it's very clear, we're globally in a very dire environmental situation. And there's a lot of things that we need to be doing differently. But there's also a lot of other pressures, there's political pressures and economic pressures that make people do things in a certain way that's destructive to the environment. So you have to deal with those things and that can get really frustrating. It's extremely satisfying to be able to say, yes, we, the numbers of these animals are going up. We can go out, we can see improvements in habitat. We can see new behaviors emerging that are more like the behavior should be when you have a larger population. It's tremendously satisfying to be able to do that. But at the same time, you do have this constant awareness that it's not so easy. It's not just we go and protect this animal and we're done. That's just the very beginning. There's all this other stuff behind you that you're juggling. You're juggling the finances, you're juggling the local political situation, you're juggling the issues of development for tourism, you're trying to deal with this, the fact that people need to make a living somehow, whether it's us in conservation or everyone around here. And sometimes there's going to be, um, I don't like using the word conflict because many of the people that we talk about as being the bad guys are not the bad guys, they're potential allies. We just haven't figured out how to turn them to join with us. So trying to navigate that can be very tricky and very difficult. So you go through some days where you just want to tear your hair out and go, why am I doing this? And other days you're like, this is fantastic. I would, I would, there's nothing else I want to be doing instead of this. So you bounce back and forth between these things. I think I should have said that with my first statement, but, but yes, conservation isn't easy at all. It is a very difficult work, a work that needs, um, to be constant. It is not a thing of a year. It is mm -hmm. not a thing of some months. It takes decades. Yes, 20 absolutely. Years, 30 years to achieve something that would really safeguard the species. Mm -hmm. But in there, no, no, not the work, the work is not done yet. You have to still be working. Yeah. And you mentioned a lot of factors, very important factors that many people overlook when mm -hmm. talking about conservation. Like for example, the finances, many, currently, many conservation NGOs are facing serious financial problems due to the pandemic yes. effects and Absolutely. the loss of, of tourism, of, of mm -hmm. everything, you know? And, and that's why also it is important to support them. Is your foundation accepting donations? Um, yes, it's a little bit tricky for us because we're in Vietnam and we do not have the 501c3 status in places like the US. However, our primary sponsors are in Germany. That's where we get most of our funding from. So Zoo Leipzig, which was a big zoo in Eastern Germany, yeah. they are where we get most of our funding from. So donations made to them will come to us. Uh, we also have some support from the Alwetter Zoo in Münster. They actually helped found us and recently we shifted over to, uh, to Leipzig as our, our primary sponsors. And there's a, another organization called ZGAP, which is a, another small German organization based out of Landau right now. They're really interesting because they focus very much on critically endangered species that don't have a lot of attention. So they're not gonna be supporting things for orangutans and gibbons and things. They'll be supporting things more for the animals that people don't know about as much obviously depending on their finances. Uh, they've been with us as well for the last 20 years. We, we were founded in, in 2000 and the initial founder, the initial support came from the Elwater Zoo in Münster and ZGAP and ZGAP has stuck with us the entire time. So they've been fantastic. Great, simply great. Uh, I, I wanted to inquire a little more on, on that area. Mm -hmm. um, well, you already mentioned when was the foundation, the foundation, right? Or the project. It's, yeah, it's, it's the status has always been a bit funny because the names in German always they can rename things differently. So it's the Kappa Langer Conservation Project. So it's always referred to as a project, but it is actually a small independent NGO, technically an INGO, but it's a small NGO. Well, I will call it NGO, as you said. So <laughs> um, what 
which were the first challenges you found when you founded the so the, I didn't I didn't found the organization so you were in that yeah. time right uh, sorry for that but I I don't know what I wanted to say was like well let's talk about the present then what are some of the challenges you have faced working with this NGO mm. and with the species yeah. in in Katba? It might be helpful for the viewers to have a little bit of a background on the project as a whole, and maybe the species too, to put it in a, a better context. So let's start with the species maybe, and go with the species first. So the cat Langer, it's a, it's a leaf-eating monkey. Um, it's part of the old world monkeys. It looks a lot like a lot of the other Langers do. It's a really long-limbed, lanky thing with a very, very long tail. It's a limestone specialist, so it, it is specialized for living on karst and spends most of its time on these cliff areas. Where it is right now is a small island. It's not that small technically, it's about 330 square kilometers. So it's about 20, 20 kilometers by a little bit less than 20, but it's a lot of bays and peninsulas. So it's very complicated landscape. They're only found on this particular island. Now, if you go back 12,000 years ago, this was during the last ice age. And during the last ice age, sea levels were about 120 meters lower than they are now. So all of this area here that is a bay with a whole bunch of islands used to be land. And these animals, thousands of years before that one was still all land, most likely ranged from Southern China, which is, has a similar landscape of this limestone pillar sticking up all the way down through this part of Vietnam. And as the climate changed, this is a natural process, as the climate changed, the group separated, became isolated, species in between went extinct, or individuals' populations went extinct. The animals that were left in this greater northern Vietnam, Ho Long Bay area, were trapped on the islands as the waters rose. And this was the island that was the largest island. It was the only one large enough to actually maintain the population of these animals here. So there's not, this is not the only endemic species here. There's a lot of endemic species here. You know, what that means, though, is that for roughly 12,000 years, these animals have been confined to this one island. So they've always, they would have been a very small population no matter what. Then humans came here, of course, and started doing different things. Um, for the most part, initially, humans, when they came to this area, were living off of the sea. The interior of this area is really difficult to get around in, so it's mainly fishing and using the, those resources. But over time, they started doing agriculture in the valleys and things, and sometimes they'd hunt the animals. This would go on for all that population slowly to drop. There was some logging in the area that destroyed some of the habitat. So the population dropped and dropped and dropped. We think in the 1960s, there were probably about 2,500 to 2,700 animals. Realistically, over the last 12,000 years, there's probably never more than about five or 6,000 at any given time, just given the size of the island. But by the 1960s, it was about 2,500, 2,700 animals, we think. By the time our project started in 2000, November 2000, population had dropped to close to 40 animals. And what had happened in the 90s, this was this is a national park here. This park was made in 19, founded in 1986. And during the 1990s, this area opened up to tourism. And there is a tradition of hunting for traditional medicines and things. Oh. So many of the tourists that came out were saying, hey, I want some of these. The local folks were like, yeah, sure, there's lots of them. We'll get one for you. And with any animal that has a relatively long gestation cycle and all already is kind of on the, the margin of its habitat, the numbers fell rapidly. Uh, some studies were done in the late 90s, so 1999, one of them was done, and no one had really come out to look at these animals in a very, very long time. And they went, oh my God, these animals are almost extinct. We have to do something right now. Vietnam and Germany have a good relationship. Uh, North Vietnam and East Germany are allies, and when each country unified, they maintained a close relationship. So a lot of NGOs here have German funding and German support, which is why we are organized by the Germans. So several German organizations came together and said, this is really important, we have to put something together and founded our organization. Uh, the first director of it was uh, Rosie Stenke. And she came out in, in 2000, spent seven years here dealing with how to build up the project, organizing the people, getting local support, starting up some of the education programs, getting the park as a primary allies, dealing with the local politicians, kind of building the framework and structure. Uh, after that, Danielle Schrud came out, who spent three years here, continuing that work and building on it, adding some new pieces to it. Uh, then Rick Passero from the U.S. came out. Similar work, also managed to do a translocation of some animals that were trapped in a smaller area and moved them to rejoin the larger population. 
he stayed for three years and I came out in 2014. And I've been trying to continue the work and also refine what we've been doing a little bit. There, one of the important things is the data you collect. What do you do with data? If you collect data and they let it sit, it's no good. You have to use the data to do stuff and learn stuff. So we've I've gone through and taken all the old data and reformatted it in a way you can actually extract information from it. So we're getting new information about that we just didn't have before. What are the peak times for uh, conception, for births? What's the pattern for these things? What's the ratio, birth ratios of males to females? Because it takes a while, but we can even tell that. What are the population trends for mortality, for infant mortality, adult mortality, and all that sort of information? So I imagine this species has many things that you don't know yet. Am I Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. A good example of that is a behavior we see sometimes. So most of our work has to take place on a boat because this is an island and you can't get to the interior. So a lot of our work takes place on boats. So we're on the boats with binoculars looking up at the animals and all that. One of the things the animals do is they come down to the edge of the water. And of course it's an ocean, so it's seawater. And they'll drink a little bit, take a little small sip, but they dip the tails in and suck the water off their tails. And people have been saying for a long time, oh, they're drinking salt water. And I keep thinking, I don't think they're drinking salt water. They're it's not drinking. You can see when they're drinking out of pools of rainwater, they're actually drinking. And in this case, it looks like tasting, testing. Mm. Now, one of the things in the area, if you look at the satellite view of the area, you see there's a whole bunch of lakes near the coast, but inland a little bit. Now, almost all of those lakes are connected by caves underwater. So they're salt water. But during the rainy season, those will get a layer of fresh water over the top. So what I think the animals are doing, the animals know that if you see a big thing of water, sometimes you can drink it. So I think they're going out and they're testing to see, is this fresh water, is it salt water? Because they don't necessarily know that an enclosed area is more likely to have fresh water than an open area is. And we don't get to see them in these enclosed areas. So we can't say for a certain this is what they're doing. We only see them on the salt side. So for us, we look at it and go, okay, they're drinking salt water, but I don't think they're doing that at all. I think it's something else that's going on. And we know that these air lakes do get this layer of fresh water because other studies looking at some of the invertebrates in the water have shown that and measured that. So there's a lot of stuff like that. There's stuff about what plants they eat through the different course of the year. Uh, there's one plant here that's another endemic plant that has very thick fleshy stalks on it and grows up in the cliffs. And it seems like they eat more of it at certain times of year. So I was talking with one of our a graduate student from University of Australia who came out here to study. And she dug through her data and turned out that they did massively increase the amount of that plant they're eating during the dry season. And I was curious about this because of several things. So obviously the stalks are thick and fleshy and have water in them, so it's potentially a source of water. Also, the leaves are very fuzzy. And they found in some other primates in Africa, they'll intentionally eat fuzzy leaves because it irritates the digestive system and it helps them basically vent everything out to get rid of parasites. And we're wondering this plant, okay, are they eating it for the leaves as a natural medicine or are they eating it for the stems to get water? And given that there's a correlation with the eat more of it during the dry season, most likely they're eating this particular plant for the water content. Water. But there's all these things we just don't know. We're just learning these things. Even though we've been here a long time, there's so many things to learn. And also a lot of the focus has been on the conservation side of trying to make sure the animals are protected and have the best chance to raise the population up, which takes a lot of extra effort, which, so, so it doesn't always go into the studying of the animals specifically. Oh, of course, exactly as you mentioned, if the animal is not protected or if the animal doesn't survive, what would be the, the importance of studying? I mean, like, um, it's better if it is alive and if it is thriving, not only to study it, but to, you know, like, conserve it, I would say. Mm -hmm. Well, and also because we have, I mean, as we're in Vietnam, we have animals that live in a similar landscape. For example, the Delacroix Slender lives near Cuc Phuong National Park, and the environment there is very similar. It's on land, not in the water, so not an island, but it is in a similar, it's a wetland area with a bunch of limestone pillars coming up. The Delacroix Slender has a much higher population than ours. It's still critically endangered. It's 200 something animals. We're at 73 animals now. But studies of either one of those can help us learn about the other one. So there's always useful information. It depends on how you apply it and what you do with it. Well, before we continue, I would like to tell my guests that Niaga just talked about the not species of Langur. There are a lot of species of Langur. And stay tuned because 
I have borderline green interview right there. I won't say a species. I won't say when will it be published, but just stay tuned. There will be more langur interviews. I already have one coordinated. Let's get back to the Kadba Langur. It yeah. deserves all the spotlight right now. Mm -hmm. So with all that you have said, I think we are passing to the form fact section, which is great. First of all, the Kadba Island is located near near Haifeng, near the frontier with China in the Halong Bay, right? That's correct, yes. You mentioned that during the glaciation, the ice age, and when, when the sea level started rising, this species mm -hmm. became isolated on Kadba Island. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's what, that's the, the hypothesis, yeah. So before continuing on to that, could, could we talk a little about the transition from being a subspecies to being its own species? What can you ah. talk about? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's a little bit of a complicated thing. Um, there's a lot of argument in biology in general about what constitutes a species. Uh, take humans, uh, modern, modern humans and Homo erectus or one of our other ancestors like this, where would you draw the line between us and that other species? We can look at them and say, yes, these are two different species. But as a thought experiment, you can take a human, go back a hundred years, and that human can have children and find with every other, any person alive at that point. You can keep doing this in steps all the way back. At what point is that no longer a human anymore? What point does it become a different species? It's like a color wheel. You can't tell exactly where red and orange stop. It transitions gradually over. So when we're looking at species, what we're really looking at is kind of a snapshot in time. It's like a photograph very quickly in time. And there are at least 30 different ways of defining a species. Commonly, what you hear in school and things is the biological species definition, which is that if two animals can reproduce and produce fertile offspring, it's a species. If they can't, it's not a species. That's no longer really used. There's too many exceptions to that. But there's elements of that still bound up in this. So when it comes to issues like species and subspecies, a lot of the work that's being done on that is genetic. And okay. again, people don't always agree with this. They say, well, this, is, this should all be lumped together. No, no, they should be staying separate. So the splitters and lumpers argument. Initially, when this species was described, it was considered a separate species. And then with the Southern Chinese species, oh no, this is very similar. They should be the same thing. And as nomenclature changed, as people looked at the taxonomy and things like that, the argument went back and forth and back and forth around. So from the very beginning, there have been two sides of this. In the very beginning, there's people saying it's a separate species and no, it's a subspecies. In 2015, excuse me, 2015 or so, I think it was, there was finally an official decision made where they split, a, split the species apart. It wasn't any sort of big dramatic thing. It was just kind of one of those things that someone finally got around to looking at the literature. And, eh, okay, let's make, the, let's make the formal decision on what it is. It is interesting though, because prior to that, the issue of subspecies versus species was actually causing us a little bit of conservation difficulty here. So how long Bay is a World Heritage Site? And Kat Ba is right on the edge of the World Heritage Site, but it's not in the World Heritage Site. The Haiphong government wanted to have the World Heritage Site including Kat Ba. And one of the arguments they made was that there are these critically endangered species here, and they included the Kat Ba Langer in that, which obviously makes sense. The people who were responsible for looking at World Heritage Sites and evaluating them and seeing if the nomination should be supported looked at the overall picture in the area and said, you have a lot of other problems here, management, uh, overdevelopment, pollution, too many people coming. We don't think this is appropriate to be World Heritage at this time until these things are fixed. Of course, the local government said, no, no, those things were ignored. We think it didn't happen because this is not a separate species. It's a subspecies, which was not the case at all. But that was the argument that they wanted to make. And it made it for a little bit of a difficult situation with the government of the country 
on what was going to happen conservation wise. Now that it's a separate species or officially considered a separate species, that's no longer an issue. But the distinction between species and subspecies can be very, very fuzzy. And you see a lot of changing of this back and forth in nomenclature over time. Don't know if that's, it's not a very good answer for you, but it's, it's kind of a complicated question to get to. I understood everything. I understood everything, but I will make it a little easier for my viewers to understand it. First mm -hmm. of all, it is worth noting that Asian primates, especially what concerns gibbons and langurs, currently they are being separated into their own species. As mentioned by Niaga, before some of them were considered subspecies of a species, but then with the genetic anal analysis and like he said, doing seeing when they diverged or I don't know how to how to say it. That sounds uh, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Diverged, diverged from being from that species to being a separate one. All of that we have to take it into account to consider a species a, a subspecies a species. It is a very complicated topic, and I think well for you this will be very difficult to understand. But. So something you might pay attention to: um, the German Primate Research Center in Göttingen, in Germany. Uh, there's a fellow named Christian Roots, and he's been putting together a, he's been collecting samples of all the Langer species he can to do genetic analysis on all of them, to try and finally put together a comprehensive taxonomic family tree of the Langer species in the world. So keep an eye on what's coming out of there, because in some point in the next few years, there may be something really important that comes out that clarifies the overall relationship between all the Langer species, but we'll have to wait on that still a while. Thanks, Miata. That's very interesting information, and I will be having an eye on them, and hopefully soon we will have a great scientific discovery on langurs. What can you tell me about the fun facts of the Katba langur? Now, leaving apart the taxonomic side of the mm -hmm. species, what can you tell me? When I mean fun facts, it can be Things that we may have may find funny, but in reality are very interesting about the species. The species. Interesting, like like behaviors or can anything about them. Anything um, about them. Well, they're really fun to watch. They're really acrobatic. The they make these incredible leaps. I've seen them drop from a tree on a cliff jump out into free space and free fall down four or five meters, grab onto a rock as they go by, twist themselves around in the air and fall into the tree and go on again. So really, really fun to watch moving. They are surprisingly quiet. The males will make a really interesting growling call. I think one of the videos I sent you may have a, a recording of the growling call they make. It's like a very nasally, kind of <laughs> which echoes through everywhere around, which is really neat to hear. The other animals, are pretty quiet, make a small coughing sound. The Vietnamese word for them is vuok, and vuok comes from the noise they make when they're calling and talking to each other. They, like a lot of langurs, they do what's called allo mothering. So the young animals, are, the adult animals are basically black with a little bit of yellowish white on the head and gray on the, the thighs. But when they're born, they're bright orange. And the thought is that that bright color attracts the attention of the other animals in the group. So it's very common to see a young animal, firstborn, completely surrounded by other members of the group, all taking turns trying to hold it and smell it and sniff it and carry it around. So this behavior is called ala mothering. And we think that it's a, a combination of group social bonding and also protection for the animals. Because when they're born, they're tiny. They're really, really small little animals when they're born. So they're at risk for a lot of different prey. Large birds used to hunt them, uh, snakes sometimes, things like that. So having the group around them keeps the animals protected. Uh, it's really funny watching the young animals with the mothers because they're obviously really active when they climb around and the mother needs to eat to get milk. So one of the things she'll do sometimes is hold on to the young animal's tail like it's a leash. So you see the young one climbing off someplace and gets pulled back by its tail and climbs off somewhere and gets pulled back by its tail again. Wow, um, the term allo mothering or allo parenting, it's, yeah. it's very common in some species, like mm -hmm. um, primates especially. And, and well, it, it's very interesting, you know, that this species was before, the babies are 
they were too tiny were haunted by other species like larger birds of prey and and snakes you know normally with a species so imperial like this one even those small and uh, i would say um, not likely because yeah it could be one in a thousand or one in a mm-hmm. hundred chance to be to have a baby lost to to being mm-hmm. prey of another animal but let's move on let's move on to the threats section this is the part where we talked about everything related to the con- to the threats yeah. to the solutions mm-hmm. to the shipments you have made but yeah. let's just start basically with the threats you already mentioned that one of them is the that there are many tourists coming or many people coming to the island how does yeah. this affect the Catbalangors? So we managed to get the areas the Catbalangors are in to be put in special protection zones, which means they're completely off limits for anybody to go and land. The management of the areas is a bit complicated. So the water areas, even though they're in the park, are actually managed by a different agency right now. And there's a lot of tourist activity directly adjacent to the linger areas. What that means is they're exposed to extremely large amounts of loud noises, which is a really damaging type of pollution for anything. Uh, World Health, Health Organization and the European Union have identified noise as being the second worst kind of pollution in terms of its damage done to humans after air pollution. Now we can put in headphones or block that off, wildlife can't do that. So there's a lot of activity directly adjacent to sleeping sites and foraging areas, which is a real problem. Um, Obviously, pollution is a big problem. We just posted recently on Facebook a picture of one of the young animals playing with a plastic bag and chewing on it. That's not something we want to have happening around the area, but all the tourists and all the tourist activity brings a lot of pollution to the area too. Tourism also brings a lot of development. Now, much of the actual infrastructure development is taking place not in Langer areas, but the island is not that big. And we actually have one male animal that has been coming over and coming into one of the tourist areas and climbing around one of the hotels actually, which is again, not something we want because that opens up the possibility of zoonotic disease transfer. These animals have been genetically isolated for a very long time. So genetically, they're very likely to be all very similar to each other. Now that may not be an issue in terms of reproductive problems because they have had this, they've been isolated for a very, very long time. So a lot of those bad traits probably were weeded out. But what it does mean is they're more likely very vulnerable to diseases coming in. And if you have the human wildlife exchange, well, that means that something could come from somebody who visits something anywhere in the world, from China, Thailand, parts of Africa, where they have other primate-based tourism. Somebody could get something there, come here, and then transfer it over to these animals, and that would be it for the population. So we're very concerned about this kind of relationship. We do have another native primate on the island. We have a rhesus macaque, which is native here. And again, these rhesus macaques would have been isolated for a long time as well. So there's a po- strong possibility that these rhesus macaques are a separate subspecies, but we don't have enough information to tell yet. But macaques are much more tolerant of human activity and the macaques are still hunted pretty often. And there's also a nearby island where they've brought in non-native macaques as a tourist attraction. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of concern about movement of potential movement of animals. If we get the non-native animals that are surrounded by tourists, then entering the island, they can hybridize and then also potentially spread diseases in and the native macaques and langurs overlap in habitat use. So there's a lot of potential vectors for problems that we're really concerned about. And a lot of them are tied directly to the tourism issue. That was what I was going to say. Macaques are very not susceptible, but they are, um, vectors of diseases, of several diseases affecting other mm-hmm. species. So yeah. imagine if, like you said, if that macaque from the other island came to this one and infected another macaque and then this macaque infects a lango, mm-hmm. it would be craziness all over. Yeah. Oh, wow. This species is in a pretty difficult, pretty difficult yeah. position right now. Yeah. If I heard correctly or I read correctly, there are 53 left in the wild, or how many? There's 73. 73. Yeah, this is one of the issues. There's been a lot of misinformation about the Langers and Langer numbers in the past. Uh, there was something published in 2006 saying there were 63, which there weren't in 2006. There were 45 in 2006. And wow. we've had the numbers constantly going up. 
in two, we thought we had the hunting stopped completely, but in 2015, we actually lost a lot of animals. There was a hunting incident from people from a different province that came over. We were up into the mid 60s at that point. That dropped us back down to the mid 50s. And we've been rising up since then. Currently, about one third of the reproductively active females are giving birth every year. So the last couple of years, we've had 12 babies born each year. Obviously not all survive. There's a certain amount of infant mortality. Mm. For us, it's about 20% infant mortality, which is actually pretty low for landers. But there's also very few predators here. There's also a certain amount of adult mortality. So you're always gonna lose a few adults. Other animals become adults. So there's a constant cycle through in the population. With the last birth, which was uh, three weeks, two and a half, three weeks ago, that puts us up to 73 animals. Plus or minus, there's a few animals we haven't seen in a while. You can't write an animal off. We've had animals disappear for over a year at a time. So if you don't see an animal for a while, you give it a few months and then you say, okay, we haven't seen this one, we'll take it off the list. Because you, you see births, but you never see deaths. You're very rarely anyway. I just want to say that, um, you know, keeping the population like that, like for example, it's, it's this cycle of life, right? Mm -hmm. Some die, then some are born and, and the transition and everything that having such a low population, less than a hundred individuals, yep. you know, if I were working with a species, I would always be like, not terrified, not stressed, <laughs> but rather like, oh my God, these species, less than a hundred individuals. My, at least my, my goal would be to get more than a hundred individuals. In Obviously, but, they, because, oh my God, but you, you know, can't, you can't so force that to happen though. I mean, no, no, no. Oh, of you, course, you, have to, you have to let nature take its course, but yeah. at least you could help, like you mentioned, in the areas yeah. where they forage, in the areas where they sleep, tourism is affecting them. Stress mm -hmm. is a cause yeah. of um, product, uh, reproductive, um, you know, uh, yeah. how can I say it? Reproductive. Reproductive stresses, decrease, basically. Yeah, decreases yeah. Um, mm -hmm. because of stress. And if they yeah. have those tourists, those boats all around where they live. We, we had a situation um, early last year where in one of the tourist areas, right around the time when there were a bunch of tourists there, there was a big case of infanticide. We lost quite a few young animals as an adult came into an area and fought and killed a couple of them. And, it, and the large, large group we had split into several smaller groups and those never rejoined. They've been separate small groups now. Mm. Now we can't prove that it's due to tourism and the activities that tourists bring to that and the disturbance from that but it did time very closely to those tourist activities and when i map our langer observations over time you can see that despite the fact that many of the good sleeping sites they prefer are right in the tourist areas most of the observations we have of them show that they are actually are trying to avoid the tourist areas as much as they can but they can't do it very much because their sleeping sites are in the area and this is something people sometimes forget about a lot of animals is that there are certain limiting factors. Animals need certain particular things and they may, it may not be very obvious what their limiting factor is. Obviously food is a type of limiting factor. You need to have food in certain areas. Um, some animals rely on certain resources. One of the key ones for many animals is sleeping sites. Some animals can sleep wherever sleep in trees, sleep under logs, sleep over. these animals have a very strong preference for a particular kind of sleeping site. And that sleeping site is not found everywhere. It's only found in the right geologic conditions here. They sleep on the cliffs, they need an overhang or sometimes a cave. It needs to be with no vegetation nearby, which is probably predator protection. And the overhang has to protect them against the weather. Now, all that's going to mean that there's a very few places on the island that meet all those particular requirements. And those areas are also, they happen to be really pretty areas because they have this towering cliffs and really dramatic landscapes. I imagine. So everyone wants to go and see these things. So this is one of our big efforts over the, over the years has been trying to figure out how do we protect the animals in the face of this being one of the major tourist destinations of Vietnam and while they're trying to make it even a bigger tourist destination. As it currently stands, we get... When I got here, we got 1.4 million tourists a year to the island, almost all of them coming during the summer, during three months during the summer. Uh, since that point, obviously this last year has been different because of COVID, but that has gone up to 2.4 million tourists. 
they are looking to, the aim is to get 5 million into rest in the next few years. And there's massive development projects all going in the area to, to make that happen. And the end goal by 2030 is 10 million tourists a year. That's what they're aiming for. The area is already beyond capacity in terms of dealing with the tourists and the impacts that tourists bring. So what will that mean for everything else that lives here and lives on this island? Because it's not just the language, it's all the other things that are affected also. Of course, they, this affects indirectly everything that's living on the island, all of the species, because if we look at, at like that, at some point, it also affects the macaques. It also affects the reptile species. It also affects the birds species. It affects it everything. Will, so on, on that particular topic, so obviously langurs are a focal thing for us. We also have three anti-poaching teams in the villages in the area made of local community members. Uh, we work with the FPD on migratory bird poaching and all these different things. So we, I, could, I can look through our records over the years of the traps we confiscate and how many how the hunting cycles are like. Despite the fact that us and the park and the Forest Protection Department have been doing a lot of work on preventing the poaching of all the other things on the island, we see a rise. As the population here increases, as tourists increase, we're seeing a rise in the hunting of things. So, and also we're seeing a big rise in hunting with firearms. Firearms are not legal, people are using air rifles and things like that but people are not using the traps as much anymore and are shifting to firearms because it's easier to hide those and we're finding a lot more firearms Ooh. on the island. The, during the migratory bird season, they'll set out big nets across huge portions of the island in the western section and catch tens of thousands of birds, which they sell to restaurants across the entire country, all completely illegal. We actually had uh, some really good investigative journalism here recently, came up with three articles nailing the people to the wall on this. But then the government went, ah, okay, we'll just let it go and didn't really do much about it. So we have really major poaching issues here on non-primate species and they're all going up. In I, large part because I we have some people in it. But, but I would also like to mention that currently Vietnam, last year, the measures they implemented were very good. Talking about Southeast Asia regarding the exotic wildlife trade, Mm -hmm. Well, they are they are doing a good job. They're doing a good job in terms of the measures. There's a big difference in the measures in the enforcement, though. And that's the key thing. You can have all these great laws on books, but you actually have to have people on the ground doing the work. Yeah, you have to implement them. That's the thing, exactly. But, well, these are small achievements that in the future mm -hmm. could be big ones, right? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, there's not much time left for the interview, so I will give you the opportunity to talk about both some of the solutions you are implementing to help the species and about some of the shipments you've had. Uh, before continuing, I would like to mention that what about ecotourism? Does Tadba <laughs> have ecotourism or that doesn't exist there? Or it's So I have a Sorry, Nia, uh, I think they're having some connectivity issues. Could you please repeat that? Uh, you there again my internet went off i think oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god <laughs> please tell me please tell me it didn't oh no 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 oh we are recording oh thank goodness sorry well we're back are you still you Issue is, the ecotourism issue is one that I have a little bit of an issue with. I actually talked about this at a presentation at the last IPS conference in Nairobi. Um, most ecotourism is not really ecotourism. It's tourism that has been greenwashed. It's got the eco label tacked onto it. Mm. But if you actually look at what's going on, there's very, very few places that actually qualify as being truly ecotourism places. And there isn't really anybody here. Maybe there's one place here that's doing proper ecotourism. But for the most part, 
through much of Asia and actually for that matter, much of the world, most of the places they're doing ecotourism, I would not consider to be actually ecotourism or sustainable in any way. Oh, that's, well, you are right up to some point because many things, and it's a great example, many things could be called sustainable, could be called uh, ecological, mm. could be called um, eco, but in reality, it is just like a label. In reality, yeah. they are nothing related to that, but just, oh, we call ourselves an eco hotel, mm -hmm. but in reality, we just pollute or do things uh, as yeah. any normal hotel. Moving on. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, you were going to say something. <laughs> um, there's a, a couple interesting things about what you can look for if you were looking to see if someone's actually being sustainable and kind of ecologically responsible, if they're in a tourism organization, look to see if they give back to the community. That's a really important thing. Look to see if the finances are transparent, if they actually tell you what they're doing with the money and you can see where it goes. And look to see how the local community views those people. Those are really key things. But they're really, one of the really big ones is making sure that they give back to the community and give back to that. Because in reality, most ecotourism places are, they're there because there's some natural resource. So one of their responsibilities needs to be to be protecting that resource. So exactly. if you have an ecotourism organization that's just using that to get money, that's not really being responsible. If they put a percentage of their profits back into protecting that, that then lets you know that they're actually aware of their position, their role, and are trying to do some benefit. So for people that are looking to see if you're going to stay someplace or go with a tour organization or something, the ones that do have regulations about what you can and cannot do, the ones that do um, limit how many people can come, for example, for sustainability issues, the ones that do make a point of showing where they give the money to and how that's used, those are ones you should be supporting and paying attention to. Right, Niaga. Very good message. And I will give you the opportunity now to say your last inspiring message. It can be related to, any, to anything. It is up to you. So right now, there's a lot of people really interested in conservation, which is fantastic. A lot of people want to get involved in conservation, which is also fantastic. It's a really difficult field. And strictly speaking, it's not necessary to be involved in the conservation field to do conservation work. What we really need to have is people in other fields who are bringing a conservation ethic and environmental ethic to their fields. People who own restaurants, people that have car industries, people that are bankers and lawyers and policymakers and educators. If we have those people bringing a conservation mindset and an environmental ethic to those fields, we likely wouldn't need as many professional people in conservation. So if you're interested in conservation and you want to do something that's benefits the conservation community and benefits everybody as a whole, you don't actually have to be in conservation as a field. You can apply that to your own work in your own fields, and that will actually have a much bigger benefit in many ways. For people that do want to be involved in conservation directly, but maybe you can't get a job in it, or you have another job you like and are happy with that, there are other ways to get involved. Citizen science is a group. Right? There's a lot of different types of citizen science projects. Uh, iNaturalist is an excellent one for collecting biodiversity data around the world and making it kind of fun and almost like gamifying it a little bit. But there's other ones too. Uh, there's several ones that you can look at camera trap pictures and help identify the animals in there, which is really useful for research or studying those areas. There's a huge range of all different kinds of citizen science projects that are taking advantage of people's interest and the technologies they have with them to access information and then give back and provide resources and uses for things. So people interested in conservation have a, an amazing array of resources and ways to help over and above getting directly involved in the actual conservation of things. Very good message, Niaga. And, and I say it again, you, have the power to do change too. You can help conservation even though you don't work entirely on conservation. Citizen science is a good example of how you can help the environment indirectly and how you can learn and inspire others to do the change too. Niaga, it was great having you. Thank you for your time. Thanks for talking with me about the Calva and about 
well, in in short words, we talked about Kadba National Park and all the situation on the island, which is very interesting, by the way. I would love to do more events in the future, mm -hmm. not only about the Kadba language, but also about the entire ecosystem of this beautiful island and Absolutely. why we mm -hmm. need to protect it. That would be fun to do. Well, I, I hope everything keeps going well with your project and I will stay tuned. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Uh, you have a great show and you have some excellent guests. So I'm looking forward to seeing your next steps with this and hopefully we'll talk again in the future. Thanks, Niaga. I hope so too. Please, people, remember to subscribe, remember to like. Please comment down below if you want a specific species for me to talk about with someone like Niaga, a conservationist working with them. I hope you like it and see you soon. Stay tuned for another wild interview. Bye. Yeah. Bye.